Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about hypothesis. Oh, just going to take this and not throw it on the ground. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Williams. I work at Shop Runner. Not related, no relation. Um, we're in San Mateo. Uh, we do shopping stuff for big box retailers. Um, I'm also a core contributor to Twisted, um, which is kind of how this, what I'm going to talk about, kind of came up and made me think we, I should write a talk about it. Um, <clears throat> I like to write tests. No, I hate to write tests, but I like to have tests. And one of the things that's a real pain about writing tests is making sure that I cover all the cases I need to cover. Um, that's why I like Hypothesis, because it makes it easier to make sure that I've got good coverage and that I'm actually hitting all the bits of the code that I really need to hit. Um, so I'm going to talk about a part of Hypothesis that maybe you haven't heard about before. If you are familiar with Hypothesis, raise hands if you've heard familiar with it. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so most people talk about the data generation stuff. I'm going to talk about a slightly different thing. So hopefully, even if you've heard about Hypothesis, this is new to you. Um, so Hypothesis uh, can be really opaque. It's hard to get into. Uh, I know I've proselytized to many people, and I don't know how successful I've been in convincing folks to use Hypothesis. Uh, the API documentation is great. So if you are already uh, of the mind that it's going to help you write your tests, then you can go to the Read the Docs page um, and learn about how to use its API. But it doesn't provide like a coherent narrative to a newcomer that's kind of makes it intuitive sense like why you would want to use this. Um, and the author, David uh, McIver, is working on this. He has another website, hypothesis.works, that has like long reads and slow takes, kind of walk you through step by step how you might write a piece of code. Like here's some code and here's how you can write a hypothesis test for it. Um, so that's really great. But the problem is you have to understand that example code first before you can understand how he tests it. And this is like a big context switch if you are like, it's the end of the day and you're like, oh yeah, Mark told me I could use Hypothesis to make my tests like way better. And now I have to go read about like this binary heap implementation to see how I could even use this. I don't have time for this. Um, so again, it can be a little bit opaque and it takes a fair amount of like the, the activation, activation energy is kind of high to kind of get into it. So today, I'm going to try a little bit of an experiment. I'm going to kind of turn things around. Um, I'm not going to talk about an example program first. I'm going to explore the Hypothesis API with a bunch of print statements. We're going to see what Hypothesis prints out. And we're going to learn about the concepts behind stateful testing. So what do I mean by stateful testing? So if you're familiar with Hypothesis, you know it can generate random data. It's kind of like a fuzzer, like a sophisticated fuzzing library. Asterisk. Um, you, then that's nice if you have functions where like you need to parse something or maybe you have to like do some other command line stuff. I don't know. Simple functions that take direct inputs and outputs. That makes a lot of sense. Sometimes you want to test an API, though. You want to make sure that when you call method A and then call method B and then call method C, or maybe you switch that order up, that something remains true or something is always false. So stateful tests are a way to generate invocation sequences. They're a way to generate uh, uh, a run of like call method A, call method B, call method C. Um, and Hypothesis is going to switch that up for you. Um, but as I said, we're going to kind of look at this from the inside out. We're going to kind of take each of these concepts and we're going to turn some dials and we're pull some levers. We we'll see what gets printed out. Um, and we're going to use that later on to actually uphold, like write a test for a real program, um, which might be interested to some people who do network parsing. It's going to be a line buffer which is kind of tricky to get right sometimes. Um, so hopefully this is more than the usual toy example you get. I don't. I think I've written more line buffering stuff than I've written heaps, so that this is like more personally relevant. Um, so we'll see how this goes. I'd be interested to hear your feedback. Please, if you get a chance after the talk to let me know if this like made hypothesis make more sense, that would be really great. This is, and if it goes really poorly, I'm going to say it was an experiment. OK, so. <clears throat> If you want to follow along, there's no pressure to do this. It's on GitHub. Um, I have a repository here. Um, go ahead and clone it. Um, just install the requirements. Um, set up a virtual and standard setup. No Docker containers. Um, and uh, if you do, if you go ahead and do this, if anybody wants to do this, raise their hands. I can pause for a moment. Um, and the, the sanity check is that you want to make sure that you have the correct version of PyTest and that the hypothesis is like plugin is registered. Um, but it doesn't seem like, yeah, you all want to listen to me. That's good. OK, so we're going to dive into it. So we're going to start with the first concept, which is a state machine. Is the code readable? Can everybody read the code OK? If not, I can switch to GitHub if you want to bear with me. Not too readable? It's OK? All right. Experiment. Um, so 
uh, we talked about stateful testing and uh, the way that you, the introduction to stateful testing, the kind of the core mechanism that drives state, that is going to contain all of our stateful stuff is hypothesis rule-based state machine. Um, and the API is that you subclass it. It's not my favorite thing, but hey, not too hard to do. Um, so we go ahead, everything we need, by the way, is going to be in this stateful submodule here. Um, so that's the only thing that we need to import from hypothesis right now. So we go ahead and write like a subclass of the rule-based state machine and we, uh, don't put anything in there. We'll get to some interesting stuff later. The real trick for right now is to notice that you have to assign a top level, uh, test case, uh, variable, like a module level variable named test case. Um, the API is a little strange. The rule-based state machine will generate a unit test test case subclass that is available as a property on the class, the state machine subclass, and your test runner won't find it. So if you just stopped before that last line and you tried to run this, it would be incredibly boring because you wouldn't even get into any hypothesis code. So this is like a necess necessary bit of boilerplate. There are a couple of other ways that hypothesis lets you interact with your test runner, but this I think is the most obvious. PyTest will pick this up and do something. So what does it do? Uh, it does something really, really boring and it says invalid definition. Uh, type example state machine defines no rules. Uh, what is a rule? Well, that's a good question. State machines need rules, obviously. So rules are ways to describe what you want invoked. Um, and they're really easy to write. Uh, at least basic ones are very easy to write. You just write instance methods and then you decorate them with this rule decorator. And you'll notice it's a callable, right? It's not the standard decorator, uh, kind of a common decorator pattern, which is that you don't have to invoke a function that returns a decorator. Um, this is one of those, so there's some tricks, there's some things we can pass to rule, we'll see later. But for right now, this is, this is perfectly sufficient. Um, and our two rules are invocations that we want hypothesis to run. All they're gonna do is print their names. So very, very simple. So this is two, we we're telling hypothesis there are two ways that you can run whatever code we care about, rule one and rule two. So when we run that, we'll see abbreviated output um, that we have rule one, rule two, rule one, 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 over and over again, and then some rule twos. And if you run this a couple of times, you'll see that that sequence will change. That's because hypothesis is going to choose which rule will be run at random. And really what happens is there's like a for loop inside of the stateful test machine and it wants to execute steps. And each step is actually a rule. Naming is so hard. Um, and it, every time it wants to do something new, it will randomly choose one of the rules that you've defined. So we've only defined two, so it's gonna alternate between these two. But again, it's going to switch up that order every time you invoke it. So, there was nothing stateful in that. <laughs> it was kind of like, why was that stateful testing? Um, nothing varied between each run. So it'd be a little bit more interesting if we could actually show an example where we store state. Um, so this is going to like, may seem obvious that in retrospect, but um, these are instance methods. So something's going to instantiate this subclass and waving my arms, hypothesis will instantiate it. So that means if we want to track state between invocations of our rules, we just have to define an instance variable in our rule-based state machine subclass. So I'm going to take the previous example, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to add that calls instance variable. Um, and we're going to print out the same thing. We're going to actually see what the value of that instance variable is. And then depending if it's rule one, we're going to add one. If it's rule two, we're going to add two. So we're going to kind of get a sense that these two aren't equivalent, and that'll show the output should vary as a result of which order those rules are called in. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. Um, so after the first invocation, rule one got called not because it's named rule one. Again, that was just chosen at random. And rule one happens to increment the instance variable by one. So after we after hypothesis calls rule one for us, we see that that instance variable is set to one. And then we see rule two is, two is called. And indeed, we added two. So now calls is three. And it will alternate back and forth between these things, modifying that instance variable as it goes. So we are, what, seven minutes into the talk? Halfway through, we actually have state. So, hey, I could stop now. <laughs> At least we have this, the name of the talk covered. Um, this is still kind of boring. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you might notice is that you don't, like, what if I don't always want rule one called? Like, maybe rule one is something that can only be called at a certain point in my program. Um, an example might be if I'm writing a network protocol. And it makes sense to call some parsing logic in, like, of various ways only after that protocol has been connected to, like, another thing. Uh, I don't want that call, like hypothesis will call that at the wrong point, I'll get an exception and I'll be incredibly frustrated because it's telling me something I already know. So it would be great if there were a way to tell hypothesis, only run a given rule under certain circumstances. 
For example, you can only run these rules after we're sure that a network connection has come up. And just as like a hint, it's going to have to do something like it's going to be able to have to look at the state that we defined, because otherwise, how do we know if the condition's been met? So preconditions are the way that we do that. You'll notice that this looks a lot like the previous uh, uh, definition, except I switched call to n. This is actually supposed to be the Colatz conjecture, which is you choose any positive integer. Um, and if it's even, then you divide it by 2. And if it's odd, you multiply it by 3 and add 1. And supposedly, for any positive integer, you'll eventually end up at 1. This has never been proven. It's incredibly hard to prove. But tonight, tonight we're going to make mathematical history, and we're going to prove it for all positive integers that are equal to 37. OK, so um, you can see that I've, we have kind of the same rules that we had before. I've renamed them even and odd. Our state variable is n, and it starts out at 37. And that gets you know, instantiated at the beginning of the test run, set up once. And then hypothesis is going to be free to choose whichever rule is applicable at the time by looking at the preconditions. The preconditions are, you define a precondition by this the decorator here, and you pass it a, which really an instance method um, that takes a single argument, the instance, of the rule-based state machine subclass. And it returns true or false. If it returns true, hypothesis is allowed to call that rule at that point. If it returns false, it has to throw it back in the pile and choose another rule, which means it's possible to get hypothesis in a state where it will make no progress and it will yell at you. So it's not that clever. But this program does eventually terminate. Um, so we see that for the even rule, which, you know, nice little modular arithmetic there. We divide it by two, which we're supposed to do for the Colatz conjecture. And we go ahead and print out the uh, value. And for the odd rule, which is the kind of the opposite of that, uh, we do the three times n plus one, which we're supposed to do. So that seems to be the program as we expect. So if we run that, we see that it does indeed control the rules. And if you go through and piece through the, uh, I'm not going to do it right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I let hypothesis do it. If you go through and follow the execution, you can, you can see that it gets down to one. We've successfully proven it for positive integers equal to 37. So if you want to send me a check, I'll give you my address afterwards. Um, so this is actually right now very, very powerful. We, this is sufficient to implement what I just described, uh, a network protocol set up, test suite that would ensure that parsing logic only happened after a successful connection. Um, so that's pretty good and let's like this is actually all we really need there is a there are com a couple of other concepts like bundles i'm not going to cover because you don't really need them to do some really useful stateful testing um and we're going to get to the real code so before we do that just want to review we know that we have state machines and that they need rules so you follow that boilerplate to get a state machine and you're not done until you define rules with that decorator um, we also know that rules are called in a random order, which if you get some weird behavior that doesn't make sense, remember, oh yeah, hypothesis is free to call those rules in any order that it that makes sense at that time. And what makes sense means you can define with preconditions and you can modify in those rules the state that you've assigned in those instance variables. So it's kind of a small set of things to remember when you write these tests, but it ends up, I think, being pretty powerful. So we're going to talk about line buffering which is something that comes up a lot because back in the 80s, we thought that line buffering was like, like line-based protocols were a great idea. Um, kind of not the easiest thing to write a correct line buffering routine. I made it especially hard because I decided to make the thing that collects lines a list. And then we assemble the line only at the last moment. So this is like a great place to have off by one errors and all sorts of dumb problems. Um, and indeed, the first time I wrote this code, I got a couple of things wrong. Um, so you don't have to look, you're free. This is all on GitHub. You don't have to like, this will be up for the rest of the talk. So don't worry about like having to memorize that. You will have to like kind of look at that more quickly. Um, the real point of this though is that it was not immediately clear to me that I'd gotten this right. And indeed I'd gotten it wrong. But it was clear to me what the API should be. So the API, before we dive into it, is uh, like what the tests actually look like is I'm free to call feed anytime I want, maybe with a complete line, maybe with not a complete line. And it's always going to be stuffed into a buffer, which is a list that we define at the, uh, in the initializer. And then at some point later, I'm going to want a, a complete line um, if one's available. So what we do is we go ahead in our read line method and we look through all the stuff in the buffer and see if we have a new line. If we do, we cut things up to get that complete line out. We give it back to the user and we put the remaining stuff back in the buffer because it's not a complete line. And if we don't have a line, we raise no line because returning none is terrible. Don't ever return none. Um, so that the API kind of thinking about that abstractly, it's like, okay, well, I can send anything I want into feed. Sometimes it's going to be a line. Sometimes it's going to be a partial 
like not really a line, like a complete line. And anytime I call read line, I want a complete line back. And if I call read line multiple times because there are multiple lines waiting for me, I want them in the order that I receive them, right? So those are two kind of invariants, things that should be always true about my code. So even though I wasn't sure if this implementation is correct, like I understood line buffering well enough to express that. So how can I use what we've learned to test this code? Well, there are two kinds of inputs that we're going to have, two kinds of like things that are going to live in the buffer. We're going to have like partial lines and complete lines. So that's the state that we're going to need to track because we're going to need to decide if we have a line, then it's a good time to call read line. And if we don't, it's not a good time to call read line. So I track the state on the state machine instance with those two instance variables that are lists. Now I'm going to have two rules. <clears throat> uh, one rule, I'm using partial, the, this you'll see here that I'm using a keyword argument to that decorator. This is the data generation API stuff in uh, Hypothesis. You can look at the real definition of that in GitHub. Not going to talk about that. Just wave my hands and say, believe that this returns a sequence of bytes that's guaranteed to not contain any line. Um, so every time Hypothesis invokes this rule, it'll give it a random sequence of bytes, but doesn't have a new line in it. So we go ahead and feed that into our line buffer uh, implementation. Um, and we also stash it into our partials list. So we know what partial data we have, and we've given it to our line buffer implementation. We also can feed it a complete line. We know that we've given it a complete line because the data is exactly the same as before. Well, it'll be a different each time, but it's guaranteed to end in a, a new line. And we do the exact same thing, but we are doing this as we go along. And we know very well we've gotten a complete line. So we need to swap data out of the partials buffer into the complete buffer. And now we know we've got at least one complete line. OK, so that covers the two kinds of inputs that we can get, partial data and complete data. Now we want to actually like call it back. And we don't want to call read line and expect a line back if there's not been a line yet. And similarly, we want to, like, I want 100% coverage. So I'm going to have a negative test case where I know there's no line yet, and I want to make sure I got no line raised. So I want to cover those two ways that read line can behave. So we use preconditions to say that it's only OK to call this read line has complete rule when we know that there's at least one complete line waiting. So I express that by saying that the list is not empty, the completes list. And the invariant that I want to check is that when I call read line, that the most of the, the first line that arrived in that buffer comes out. right? So that's why I call pop 0. And similarly, when we have um, partial data, that is to say we have no complete lines, right? We know that there's no complete lines. We want to, we want to call and read lines should raise no line. Um, and that's it. Running this stuff, I can, if I get my other laptop, you can come look at it afterwards, will actually give me 100% test coverage. It'll run through a bunch of, it runs through 200 examples by default. Um, and when I first wrote this, I was tired and I reversed these two uh, indices, uh, which is like an obvious mistake in retrospect. Hypothesis found it faster than I did, um, so I can recommend that. And this doesn't quite fit on the same page, but I think that's a pretty good number of lines to get 100% test coverage. Um, and it's actually testing the API as I think it should behave, which is a little bit more powerful and I think more applicable than the standard data generation stuff that you can do with Hypothesis. So that's kind of the end of my talk. I didn't put like a final slide up with my email address because you can reach out to me at the Meetup page. Um, but anybody have any questions about stateful testing with Hypothesis? Go. Yeah, so you can have the... Oh, here. Do this. We'll just do this. That makes more sense. Okay. So uh, a couple slides back, you have it where it's doing a random rules. Is there a way to kind of give a seed to that rule? So if you, yes. so that you can replay that exact same sequence in case that's the sequence that gives you the problems. So yeah. That's an excellent question. And there are a couple of answers to that. The kind of this, the, the overarching answer is that Hypothesis is stateful API. Hypothesis is, is, is I, the, the stateful API in Hypothesis um, does kind of the same thing that uh, the data generation API does. When it finds a, a sequence of things, of inputs that breaks your program, it will attempt to shrink it to produce a minimal example, and then it stashes it in a local database. So you actually get regression testing for free. The downside is that you don't have it on your CI box. <laughs> so that's one way that you can do it. You can also, there's an API for um, uh, requiring, like you can describe an example that Hypothesis always has to use using a decorator. Um, so you can kind of use seed examples in your code if that makes more sense. And you can use the opposite assumes that prevents you from having data if you know it's no good. So you have like kind of three ways to handle that. I'm pretty lazy. So I just rely on the default behavior of like, if it found a broken thing on my laptop, at least it'll always run that broken thing over and over again. Question? Yeah. 
Going once, going twice. Twice. That's it. Okay. I made it under time. There we go. Thanks. Hey. Thank you, Mark. Hey, thank you, Mark. Moshe wants to say some words.